The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. All right, can anybody hear me? Great, thanks for coming. My name is Richard Hip. Um, this is a talk for developers. I hope you're all developers. If you're not developers, that's okay. You're welcome to stay. But this is a talk about programmers, or talk targeting programmers like me. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, SQLite today. I want to talk about how you ought to be using, how and why you ought to be using SQLite in your applications. And, but I also want to clear up some misconceptions. I, you know, when I talk to people and listen to people, uh, a lot of people really don't get what SQLite is about. They, they, they try and use it in their application, but they use it in ways that it was never really intended to be used. And, and they, 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 they complain about it, they criticize SQLite. Well, it's not solving my problem, even though the problem was not one that SQLite was ever intended to solve. But they try and deploy it anyway, and it doesn't work out as well as they'd hoped it would, and they're bummed about that. So I wanted to really spend a lot of time talking about what SQ, the problem that SQLite is trying to solve and how it's very different from a lot of other database engines. Now, if you're not even familiar with what SQLite is, I'll give you a brief introduction. Um, SQLite is an SQL database engine. There are a lot of these out there. Uh, we're, you're probably familiar with MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, Maria, uh, Maria SQL Server, these sorts of things. SQLite's among these. But it's fundamentally different from the others, and, and that's what I want to kind of get into. SQLite is um, an embedded database engine, whereas most of this is a client-server database engine. You've got a separate server that's in a different machine. SQLite's embedded. It's a library that links with your application and writes directly to the disk. And it's and used in a lot of applications that you're using every day. For example, uh, your web browser is probably storing bookmarks in an SQLite database. Um, uh, your, your playlists are stored in an SQLite database. Uh, you know, everybody, your call history on Skype is stored in an SQLite database, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Excel uses SQLite databases. And it's also used in a lot of gadgets because it's small and lightweight. So everybody's cell phone, and we learned in the last lecture that everybody here has a cell phone, right? A smartphone. All of your smartphone data is stored in an SQLite database. Uh, your contact lists, your, um, uh, you know, any, any, all your call history and all of that. It's, it's, it's really interesting, um, just referencing the previous, the keynote, um, we get inquiries a lot, and there's actually a lot of courses out there where you can take on um, forensics and how to decode SQLite database files at a byte level so that they can pull out um, you know, your, your browse history. We, we've actually been contacted by police agencies trying to decode the browse histories out of, out of web browsers that were stored in SQLite databases and so forth. So um, SQLite is used in a lot of places like this. Now it is open source. I, uh, it's in the public domain actually, so we don't really know how many places SQLite's being used because anybody can download and use it for free, but by counting up um, the number of applications that use SQLite or, the, or the, the, the places that we just know about and how many places are in use, we estimate that there's over 2 billion running instances of SQLite right now and it's used in over 500,000 different applications. Most of those are smartphone apps but it's also used in other things as well. Um, we're used in big things too. Um, SQLite is in the avionics on the new A350, uh, the, yeah, the Airbus A350. Um, it's used in some big companies to run big things, but it's usually in gadgets. So the, what I want to talk about today is to make a distinction here and to, and to talk about how SQLite is different from the others, is to distinguish between an enterprise data depot versus an application file format. A lot of people, they, they hear SQLite, it's SQL. Their, their, their brain immediately connects SQL with big data. 
because all of your life, anytime you're dealing with an SQL database, you're dealing with large quantities of data. And the SQL database is concerned with um, being an enterprise data depot. Now, what, what's, what do I mean by the difference here? Let me get that cursor out of the way. The, uh, an enterprise data depot is the big central repository for data in, in your application. Uh, it's, it's typically remote from the application itself, whereas in an application file format, it's, it's local. Um, an enterprise data depot stores the information that's global. The entire enterprise has access to it, whereas an application for, file format stores information that's private to the particular application. Uh, if you're drawing pictures of your topology or your system, you, you tend to, with, with the, the enterprise data depot, you make a cloud, and that's where the data goes. Whereas in an application for file format, the data is a document. Um, the, uh, an application format, file format is, is separate, and it's distributed amongst all your devices. Whereas an enterprise data depot is centralized. Uh, so application for file formats are kind of different from the enterprise data depot. Um, an application file, is, it, it stores a complete bit of information, a standalone information. We use the document metaphor for that. Anything that could be a document might be an application file. It, it could not have a complex internal structure and it might mix text and images and so forth, but it's a document as opposed to the cloud. Um, now sometimes people store documents as a single entry in your enterprise database. In fact, we have a whole class of database engines, you know, document databases, MongoDB. Um, sometimes people will take a document and they'll tear it all apart and extract the individual pieces of information and then store it in their enterprise data depot is fields scattered all, all over the place. Or other times, you'll have a massive enterprise database, which say maybe has all the sales history for the entire data or for your entire enterprise, and you want to extract a document from that, which is just the sales information for a particular customer. You might pull out a slice. So there is some intermingling between the ideas of an application file and an enterprise data depot, but they're really very distinct. So here's some examples of application files. Uh, a presentation. This, uh, you know, what I'm presenting to you here. It's a, it's a document on my desktop, and it, it, uh, that's an application. A spreadsheet. Uh, if you're in a laboratory environment, you might be running experiments and collecting the data there, and then as the data is, um, you know, analyzed by members of your team, you know, you'll add annotations to the data and so forth. An itinerary, an expense report, a quality assurance report, financial models, shipping manifests, and so on. Configuration files, an ebook, a flight plan, not necessarily a flight plan for a, an airliner, but maybe this is a flight plan that you upload to your uh, quadcopter, and, you know, which is going to fly over Alan Hicks's house and take pictures or something. I, I don't know. The, um, so all of these things are examples of application files, an installer, um, and the key thing that I wanted to point out here is that the whole point of this lecture is to, to say that whereas the other database engines are really trying to be an enterprise data depot, SQLite wants to be an application file format. It's a completely, it's solving a completely different problem. Um, SQLite's not trying to replace these other guys. It's not trying to compete with them. SQLite's trying to compete with FOpen. Now, I'm using fopen here as a metaphor. You know, I'm, I do a lot of programming in C. fopen in C, of course, is the function call you use to open a file on the disk so that you can just start reading and writing from it. Now, in your language of choice, that might be a different routine, but I'm going to use fopen because that's what I'm comfortable with. So SQLite is really a replacement for fopen. It's not a replacement for MySQL or Postgres. Um, just to drill this home a little bit further, uh, you know, suppose you're, you're making a desktop application. It could be any type of application, really, but here's a desktop application. And typically, you know, you'll have a file save or a file open menu option. And 
if you're making something new, what most people do is they will do F open when, the, when you do file open, and then they'll either read or write um, maybe some XML or some JSON, some YAML, maybe you're, if you're in Python, it's a pickle file, uh, maybe some custom binary format. The real popular choice, if you're just doing it yourself, is what I call a pile of files. This is where it's your, your application data is not stored in one file, but you create a directory and maybe subdirectories under that and you put lots of little files. And this comes up a lot if your application needs to store both text and say images. You want to keep those images as separate JPEGs as you write them out and then the text is in some other file that might be encoded as XML or JSON or something. And that's a really popular thing to do, but you create a pile of files that way. That's a really popular way of doing it. And my, the point of this whole talk is to convince you that it would be better, you'd be much better off if instead of doing this yourself, you would just open a connection to an SQLite database and write all of your information into the database. And so, here are the top 10 reasons why you should be using SQLite as an application file format. Reason number one, SQL gives you a high level schema and a, a complex query language. You know, the big, uh, um, uh, the quote is the essence of computer, uh, uh, representation is the essence of computer programming. Anybody ever heard that before? Ever read The Mythical Man Month? Fred Brooks? Show me your flow chart. Representation is the essence of computer programming. Show me your flow charts and conceal your tables and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables and I won't usually need your flow charts. They'll be obvious. That's amazing. He used the word flow charts. Okay, to be fair to um, Fred, when he wrote this in 1973, Flowcharts were state-of-the-art in software development technology. This is what everybody did. Whoever here has ever written a flowchart? Okay, yeah, a few of you, maybe. <laughs> you at least know what a flowchart is. We don't really do flowcharts anymore. But this isn't. But 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 the. But what he's saying is a timeless truth. Representation, how you represent your data, is much more important than how you implement the algorithm. Now. Moving forward in time, uh, Rob Pike says essentially the same thing. Data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, algorithms will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. And this is a Linux conference after all, so of course we need to come quote Linus Torvalds. Bad programmers worry about the code. Good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships. So how does this relate to SQLite? You've got a schema. You've got an SQL schema that carefully defines all of your tables and typically it's self-documenting. So if you write something and hand it off to somebody else to maintain or if somebody else wrote something and they hand it off to you to maintain, you can typically look, look at the schema if it's in it if it's uses an, an SQL database and get a good idea of what's going on, especially if maybe they were thoughtful and included maybe a one-line comment on each column of each table telling you what it was supposed to mean. Uh, you can usually figure that out pretty well. On the other hand, if they've just given you a custom pile of files format that they invented themselves, unless it includes a document, you're going to have a hard time figuring out what it's supposed to do. So, it, so SQLite gives you this schema right away. You don't have to spend a lot of time writing documentation on what your file format is or conversely you can admit that skip and then the person who comes after you and has to maintain this doesn't have to spend a lot of time trying to reverse engineer your file format. It's, it's self-evident. So SQLite also provides you the SQL query language which is really a programming language that it's a very, very powerful thing that will reduce your workload substantially. SQL is an interesting language in that you don't specify how to compute something, you specify what it is you want to compute. And what I've found is that if you've never done SQL before, it takes your mind 
some time to get to really understand this concept. You have to really work with this for a while before you can grok what I mean by this. But it's a very powerful metaphor. Um, we find that 10 lines of SQL will typically replace 1,000 lines of procedural code. That means you'd work faster, fewer opportunities for error. Errors, bug density is, is pretty much constant per line of code, regardless of your choice of language. And so if you choose a language that has fewer lines of code, you're going to have fewer bugs in general. You get all sorts of automatic constraint enforcement, you get ACID transactions, you get access to a full text search engine, you get access to a geospatial search engine. There's lots of things that are going on here with SQL that you don't get for free. So here's, um, there's, uh, Alexander Lloyd gave this talk at Berlin Buzzwords a couple years ago, and he was talking about, um, this was a talk on Google's uh, global scale SQL database called um, Spanner. And it's kind of internal to Google. I don't know, any, nobody really knows anything about it unless you're a Google employee. But he was talking about it. He says there's been a big cultural shift at Google. The SQL based analytics engine Dremel made a lot of SQL converts in engine, at Google. People realized it's incredibly powerful just to push the semantics of your query down into the storage system and let it figure out what to do. This is the point. When you're writing a program, when you're writing an application, you want to focus on what your end user needs and what the end user is, is, is going to be experiencing and how you can best serve your end user. You don't want to spend a lot of time messing with bits and bytes and how you're going to get it back and forth off the disk. Let the database engine worry about that for you. Now, um, so that's no reason number one. Reason number two is the content is accessible. Uh, by that I mean that it's likely to endure. You can, it, it's an SQL database. SQL, according to O'Reilly, uh, Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly and Associates, is the most widely known programming language in the world. More people know SQL than any other programming language. So it's sort of a universal. And it's also very searchable, accessible, um, with SQLite especially, if you're, if you're working on a Mac or a Linux box, the, the tool to access an SQLite database is normally built in by default. It's just type SQLite 3 database name and you got it. Now on Windows, it's not built in by default, but it's an easy download. It's just a single exe file. You download it, put it somewhere, and you can go after it. And so the content is very accessible. It's long-lived. Um, the content is also easily extensible. And I don't remember what my next slide is. Yeah, here we go. The content is easily extensible in that uh, you, you first write a new program or application and you think, oh, this is great. If it's going to be any good at all, then at some point you're going to want to enhance it, extend it, modify it, improve it. And when you do that, you're going to have to start storing more stuff. Now, if you've written a custom format, that means you've got to have upgrade procedures, et cetera, et cetera, and it's a real hassle. If you've got an SQL database, you can normally do your extensions simply by adding new tables or adding columns onto existing tables. And it's completely backwards compatible. It takes no time. It's very easy to extend. Um, with an SQLite database, you get uh, it, the, the database file is a single dot is a single file on disk. Now with an enterprise database, like say MySQL, when you create a database, it's a bunch of mysterious files off in some directory somewhere on your computer that only your DBA knows about. I don't know where they're kept, but it's a bunch of files, it's not a document. Whereas with an SQLite database, it's a single file, it's a document, it's something that you can take and send as an email attachment. or send somebody through chat. It's, 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 it's a document that you can send around. That's a very important concept that isn't available in other database engines. SQLite is cross-platform and cross-language. Uh, it runs on, on big Indian, little Indian, 32-bit, 64-bit. Uh, the same database file is, is portable between all of these things. So say you're in a lab environment 
and you've got some instrument making measurements and it's a MIPS processor which is big Indian 32-bit and it's writing the database file and that's fine and it's putting integer raw integer data in there and that's fine and then you pull it off and you're doing it on your Linux uh, Intel based workstation 64-bit and you read that in, those integers are going to be byte swapped automatically. You don't have to worry about Indian issues, you don't have to worry about word length issues, um, you don't have to worry about if the text is UTF-16 or UTF-8, all of these conversions happen automatically. And then if you're working in, a, in a, a, an environment where you have lots of different teams that are using the same data, your different teams can choose whatever programming language they want. So say you take some measurements and it's stored in a database file and then there's a team over here and they're responsible with, with sanitizing the data and they like to program in Perl, well that's fine. It's a, it, it, the Perl can access an SQLite database and then you pass it on to some other team and they like to program in Java, well no worries because they can still access the same data and use it the same way. And then there's another team over here and they're doing some detailed analysis in Fortran 4 and you can still read and ac write, access the same database without each one of these teams having to recreate the same I.O. code and understand the file format in detail. You get atomic transactions when you're working with an SQLite database. This is, um, uh, this is, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, I, I, I develop my, my primary desktop is, is Ubuntu Linux. I'm, I'm not real fond of Ubuntu per se, but the guy that sells me my computers, uh, the only Linux option he has is Ubuntu. So that's what I take. And I, it, used, it used to be years ago, I would um, build up my own hardware and install my own OS and configure it the way I wanted to. These days, I just you know, place the order and it comes in a box and the root password is taped on the box and I just plug it in and then I start using it. And that, that's what I do now. Um, and so he ships it with Ubuntu and I use it. But anyway, uh, this is um, LibreOffice. Libre do you say LibreOffice or LibreOffice? How do you pronounce it? In OpenOffice, what OpenOffice used to be. Yeah, the, 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 desktop, the desktop environment formerly known as OpenOffice. <laughs> what is it called now? Anyway, that's what this presentation is in. And this is um, what it does here. And, uh, you know, whenever you do file save, you've got this little bar that moves across the bottom and it shows you it's writing all the stuff out to disk. I, you know, I, I find that exceedingly annoying. I have um, you know, uh, uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM and an SSD, uh, uh, SSD drive. And it, it, why am I waiting for this thing to write? Why isn't it instantaneous? Well, doing it because of, you know, they're, they're, it, it has to uh, slowly um, write all this stuff out to disk. And it does it all in one, one bunch. If you had an SQL, if it, it had used an SQLite database, every time I pressed a key, it could make that change, and make it atomically, and it would be pretty much instantaneous. There would there would be no need for a file save at all, because it would automatically save as I typed. Atomic transactions, incremental and continuous updating, same idea. Um, Open Office, it, it requires you to save this big thing out to disk. It's a write operation. It takes time. Whereas with an, a database, you can make individual changes as they occur, and they're guaranteed to, to be atomic. You're not, if you lose power in the middle of writing, you're not going to corrupt the file. It'll automatically recover. There's no recovery process that has to occur. Um, picking on Open Office some more, which this presentation is done in that, Picking on it some more, if you do lose power in the middle of saving an open office, um, I, I don't know if whoever who, who your uses that. If you if you lose power, you know that then when the next time you bring up the document, you have to go through a recovery procedure. It's beyond annoying. Uh, if it were a database file, none of that would be necessary because recovery would be automatic and pretty much instantaneous. Um, there, if, you, if you use SQLite as your application file format, there's no parsing code to write or debug. 
that saves you work, and that also means that there's less bugs in your program. Well, I guess I've got another slide coming up on that in a minute. Um, SQLite is multi-process and multi-thread safe. That means that if you're using SQLite as your application file format, two or three or ten different processes could all be trying to access the same application file at the same time, and all of that will be taken care of for you automatically. What if you tried to bring up two instances of, of, your other, of some other desktop program and access the same file at the same time? That would create problems, probably. But here it's taken care of automatically. Thread safe is, uh, it, it, you can also access it from multiple threads and not have to worry about any of the locking issues, not have to worry about overwrites. And finally, you get improved performance. Here is a chart showing read times for blobs out of SQLite versus out of a file system, out of uh, ext4, just to, just to open the file and read it, versus read it as a blob out of SQLite. And so if, um, you know, an entry right here, so for a 10K blob uh, uh, with a page size of 8192, you, the, you can read the information out of an SQLite database 2.24 times faster than you can open a file and read it off the disk. Now this is true for smaller blobs. As you can see, if you get out for larger ones, you eventually lose time. And I think the difference here is that uh, just the simple overhead of calling fopen and opening the file descriptor takes time, whereas if you've got the database file already open, it can just reach in and grab it. This interesting fact that, that SQLite is actually faster, up to twice as fast at reading data off a disk than out of the file system, was first discovered by um, Adobe. Uh, this is an example of a, a real-world application that uses SQLite as an application file. Uh, Adobe Lightroom, any photography people in here? Do you use Lightroom? You've heard of it, though. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a high-end uh, uh, photo analysis and processing application. And it's it, it uses SQLite as this application file format. And they came to me years ago and said, hey, we were looking. They, they store the images. The raw images are stored in separate files. But they were wondering, well, should we keep thumbnails in the database, or should we store them as separate files, too? And they ran the experiment, basically this experiment, and discovered that for thumbnail size blobs, it's actually faster to store them in the database. I didn't design SQLite to do that, it just worked out. But it is faster. So Adobe is an example of a real application that uses SQLite as an application file format. Another example would be Firefox. Um, actually, all, most of the major web browsers do it. Um, here's, but here's an example of how Firefox uses it. If you use Firefox, they have this thing called the awesome bar where you start typing into the URL thing and it, it gives you suggestions. And I use this all the time because rather than setting bookmarks, uh, you know, it knows what websites I go to a lot and so I can type the first one or two characters of the name and then the rest a lot are complete. It's really nice. And every time you press a key in, but that's hard to figure out you know, what, what websites you're typing. So every time you press a key in the URL bar of Firefox, that SQL query runs or something like that. Um, now, you're not expected to understand what this means. Simply recognize that this bit of SQL replaces thousands of lines of C++. Uh, so, NS, so SQLite is used a lot as an application file, for file, file format in, in applications that you use every day. Now even, and, and, and there's a, it's, 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 I find that it's used in a lot of applications that I don't even know about. Um, as I was making up these slides, um, somebody tweeted that this application called Locus, which is a map thing, uh, used SQLite and I checked and it does in fact and and I, I bring this up only because this 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 came up as I was actually making these slides and what they do is this is a, some kind of mapping application for your smartphone 
And when they're transferring the data from their server to your phone, they're really just sending down an SQLite database file. And all of their map data is stored in an SQLite database file. So that is their file format for transfer purposes. Never heard of them, don't know anything about them really. So let's play some what if scenarios. I've been, I love OpenOffice or LibreOffice or whatever they're calling it now. I use it all the time. But let's, let's pretend that, and, 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 oh, and the file format for OpenOffice is a zip archive containing XML files. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. If you make a, an application with, or you make a presentation with OpenOffice, and you, it, it says ODP is the extension, but you can unzip it and you get lots of content files out of it. So that's a kind of a common thing. It's a pile of files format. What if instead of doing that, they had done it with an SQLite database? Now to be fair to OpenOffice, their file format has existed longer than SQLite. So this is not that they made a bad choice, but what if it were that way? So instead of SQLite would give you the fast, low I.O. saves. You know, OpenOffice tends to crash a lot. And so, as a consequence of this, every some number of keystrokes, they will do a complete backup of what you're working on. And while they're doing that backup, which can take two to 10 seconds, depending on how fast your machine is and how big your presentation is, it locks up. So you're typing along, typing something in, and suddenly it decides to do a save in the middle of what you're typing, and everything locks up, and you see the little blue bar go across the bottom. And, and the reason it's making these backups is it tends to crash a lot and lose your data, and it doesn't want to do that. So, but if, if it were an SQLite database, it could save as you type. Every time you press a key, it could save that key, and you'd be up to date. And, and then if it crashed, you'd still have everything right there in front of you. Um, you get much faster startup. Right now, when OpenOffice starts up, it has to read the entire file, parse the entire file, load the whole thing into memory, figure it all out. Whereas if it were a database, it could just query for the first screen and be done. It doesn't have to parse the whole thing. Uh, reduce memory usage, it only has to hold in memory the part of the document that you're currently working on. The rest can be held on disk. There's no, I've already mentioned, there's no recovery process required after crash. There's no need for a file save or a file open menu option. Well, I guess you need file open to tell it which database to connect to. And then it would be file disconnect, maybe? I'm not sure. <laughs> but it, it would be different. Uh, you could have undo across sessions. You could set up triggers in your database file to automatically record every change and store it in a log file. And then your undo could just undo those changes. And that means that you could be editing, shut down, move the file, email the file to somebody else, and then, then, or email the file to yourself on a different machine, open it again on a different version of the software, and then start undoing things you had done in the previous session. Cross session undo. You get a large searchable database. Here's um, one of the bugs that came up as I was editing this very same presentation. And this comes up periodically for me in OpenOffice, is that sometimes when you do a file save, it corrupts some of the images. Now these are separate images that are stored in the zip archive. And it did it when I was actually, I did a file save when I was preparing this very presentation. And this is a screenshot from my Ubuntu desktop where it, it, when I brought it back up, you can see that the image of the Firefox browser that we saw a couple of slides ago is corrupted. And it made this corruption even though the edits that I were saving had absolutely nothing to do with that particular page. But in OpenOffice, because it's, because it's a pile of files format, it has to, uh, every time you press file save, it has to rewrite the entire file. You know, thus consuming 10 megabytes of your finite life SSD drive and and taking a long time and potentially corrupting things when there are bugs in the thing. If this had been an SQLite database, this bug would have never happened. So what if the EPUB format that's, was an SQLite database? EPUB is the format that's used by Nook and other kinds of e-readers. It, it, it's the file format used for e-book readers other than the one from Amazon. Okay. They have their own proprietary format that they will not share with anyone, but all the others use EPUB, and it is also a zip archive of XML files. Uh, EPUB is great, except it's really slow to load because 
being a, um, uh, a pile of files, in a, in a pile of files you want each file to be relatively big. And so they put an entire chapter in each file, so it has to read and parse the entire chapter that you're on before it displays anything. Whereas if it were a database file, it could potentially store individual paragraphs and separate records. And it could only need to load in the three paragraphs that were on screen at that point. It wouldn't have to load in the entire chapter. Come up very much quicker, use less memory. You could have full text search. The EPUB readers are really annoying when you try and search because they're basically grepping the entire document. But you could have full text search, full Google style search to find things in your book if you had it stored as an SQLite database. Um, just, you know, as an experiment, I, I wrote this little program uh, that what, what if you wanted to convert, say, an EPUB or a, 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 an, an open office document into an SQLite database? It's already kind of engineered to be a pile of files. What, what if we built an archiver, a zip-like program that stored its data in an SQLite database? Here's the schema for such a thing. We've got the name of the file as the first field, its access permissions and the last modification time, the original file size, and then a big blob that, can stores, the, that stores the compressed content. And I actually have this. There's a website there. You can go and download the code if you want to play with it. I'm not suggesting this is useful for anything. This is merely a proof of concept. Uh, the advantages over something like Git is it's now transactional. If you lose power in the middle of a save, it doesn't corrupt the old copy. It's concurrent, it's random access, you can update it without having to rewrite the entire file. And what was really surprising to me is that the file sizes are no bigger. This is actual data. Um, this is uh, the top line is this presentation that you're looking at prior to inserting the slide, of course. I mean, this is an older version of it. And it's just over 10 megabytes. And what I did was I unzipped it and then I used that SQL archiver utility to, re, to insert it all into an SQLite database. And the SQLite database was actually slightly smaller by half percent, which I found difficult to believe. <coughs> Excuse me. So I thought something must be wrong. I took the same files and I re-archived them with zip and it was slightly smaller still. So what this tells me is that OpenOffice the, the zip archiver that's kind of built into it is not doing the best job of compression. Maybe they have the compression turned down on it or something, I'm not sure. But anyway, we can see that an SQLite database is really no much, it's not significantly larger than a zip archive. So what, are, who uses Git? Yeah, we got Git users around. You know, Git, its file format is a pile of files, right? I mean, you got the .git folder and then you have a bunch of files in there, which are maybe your content, unless they're packed files, in which case there's some binary format that is only known to Git. And uh, so what if instead of using a pile of files, Git had used an SQLite database? There's a lot of advantages that would come out of this. Uh, you'd get much richer user interface for a lot less work. Uh, and I've got some examples of that. If if, it, um, if you lost power in the middle of a Git GC, it wouldn't corrupt your data, it wouldn't corrupt your repository, okay? It would automatically roll back. It, it makes it really easy to add things like wiki and tickets to the repository, which are completely missing now. You get concurrent access, the multiple processes can be checking things in and checking things out at the same time on the same repository. Um, if you make an error in coding, say that right now Git re pretty much relies, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the, um, the Git relies on the code being correct for not corrupting your repository. If there's a bug in the code and you do a commit, it could seriously corrupt what you have. Um, but if you had a database with transactions, you could, you could start a transaction, make what changes you needed to the repository, and then go back and double check and make sure everything was still accessible and everything still worked before you committed. And if something was wrong, you could just roll back and nothing was lost. You get on-the-fly compression instead of having to run git gc, and your repository is now a single file. So you can email your repository to somebody. I guess you can email your repository now, but first you have to 
tar it up into a tar ball or something. But with this way, it's just a single file. So here's an example of uh, what, you know, you know, the kinds of things that you might come out with the user interface. Uh, here's a, um, a timeline graph of a repository not Git. And this timeline uh, from a historical timeline like that is actually generated by that bit of SQL. Well, okay, we add to that about 520 lines of C code to convert the output into the JavaScript that actually draws, draws the graph. But this is extracting all of the information. Now, if, if you're familiar with Git and you know the repository format, and you might look at this and say, okay, well, in order to extract that information from the Git repository, this is what I would have to do. And you start thinking, you know, the, the Git lib utilities that you'd call to, to, to extract this information. And if you did that instinctively, you're doing it wrong because you shouldn't have to think about that. You should be thinking about what the user experiences and then you just write down what it is you want and let the database engine figure out what to do. So you could, you could add lots of interesting reports. Here's a report I did. Uh, I transferred the Postgres Git repository into a different uh, repository that used SQLi. And I, I, you know, just to find out who, who in the Postgres community was doing lots of commits. And Tom is number one and Bruce is number two. Okay. And, uh, and you think, well, I think you can, you can get this sort of same information off of GitHub. Can you not? Doesn't GitHub have some graphs like this to show who the, who the committers are in a repository? You know, now think about how, you, how would you do that if you had a Git repository? You'd, well, and already people are starting to think, well, I, I'd make these particular calls. And no, you're doing it wrong. That's how you do it. That's the query <laughs> that gives you the answer. Okay? Don't worry about how you go about accessing the data. Just take the data and then display it in a way that's useful to the end user. Here's an example. Uh, here's just an outrageous example of an SQL. This is a query in SQL. If you take this, you copy it and paste it into the SQLite3.exe command line shell. This is what you get. <laughs> no joke, you could try this at home. Now, there are actually much faster ways to compute the Mandelbrot set, but, um, and this is, not a, this is not a practical thing to do in SQL, but my point is, it didn't take that many lines of code. It was very compact, and it would actually do it. And, and so SQL gives you all of this power this for free, and so you can spend all of your, 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 your time focusing on providing value to your users rather than having to spend time figuring out how to move bits on and off the disk. Uh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. So, in summary, I see a lot of people getting really confused. They see SQLite, it has SQL in the name, therefore it must be something to store enterprise data. And they try and do that. I think SQLite is now the default when you install Ruby on Rails. And they try and do massive Ruby on Rails websites with SQLite and it falls down badly. Because that's not what it's designed to do. You know, it's, it's really convenient in Ruby on Rails when you're, you're just prototyping to have something handy and not have to set up a separate server. But it's not what it's designed to do. It's designed to be a file format. It's designed to replace fopen not MySQL or Postgres. Top 10 reasons. Remember these, there'll be a quiz later. Three truths. Representation is the essence of computer programming. It's really all about how you store your data. The data is gonna live longer than the code. Think about how you're gonna store your data because that's really important. Don't just be making a random pile of files. And premature optimization is the root of all evil. Donald Knuth. So, I ask you, I implore you, the next time your fingers start typing F open, stop and think, would it be better to use an SQLite database in this, for this context? Usually, the answer will be yes. Thank you for your attention. I don't know how much time I used. But I imagine we have a lot of time left for questions. Yeah, uh, we got 
15 minutes for questions if you have any. Yes, sir. So, uh, first off, I'll repeat the question. First off, uh, it's a great product, so thank you very much for yes. being available to us. Um, he was thanking me for the great product. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, what's the threshold? How, how, how much data do you, need, do you need to store before you need to move to a client server database engine? Um, really or how much data do you need to store before it's useful to use SQLite? It's oh, how much data do you need to store before it's useful to use SQLite? Um, uh, I never thought of it in those terms. Uh, so I guess what I'm getting at is this is uh, a bit where accessibility is an issue. If I just have a small YAML file for the right, so, configuration, yeah, so you know, I advocate using SQLite for configuration files, and I get a lot of pushback on that. I'm surprised that nobody objected when I actually mentioned that earlier, because a lot of people in this room in particular, you're used to editing, say, an Apache configuration file or a, an Nginx configuration file, and you like that text format is really accessible, and I get that. And there are places where an ASCII text configuration file works great. Um, where you'd want to consider using an SQLite for an application for a configuration file is where you're mixing binary data in with the configuration file. Uh, so, you know, that doesn't work as well. Then you have to split the binary data out into separate files and that doesn't work as well. Or where the application file is not intended to be edited by humans. I mean, my phone is full of, of configuration files and I don't edit any one of them in a the text editor. In fact, I don't even have that capability. Uh, so all of your, like a phone application, the configuration files for that are going to be done by program control. And it's usually much better to do that with SQLite because it's much easier for a program to uh, use SQLite than it is to do an ASCII text format. It's also reusable that way. Yeah, I get the idea though that uh, Apache, I'm not, I'm not recommending the pa Apache change to an SQLite database for the configuration file. Though there are some interesting things that could be done if they were to do that. But I do, I, I get that, yes, yes. So if, I'm, if I'm versioning like my, my own like small framework to be yes. a file. And you're versioning it. And I want like the default config to be visible if I like do the revisions. Right, and, and if, well, you, cause you, can, you can also version a database, but you can't diff it is the problem, yeah. And so there, there, are, there, are, there are cases where a simple text file will still do, will, is still better, but there's also a lot of cases, the majority of cases, the ones you're not thinking about, like the ones on the phone, or the ones on any kind of Windows box, um, they're done by program control and you want those in the database. Question right here. It's just a comment, um, as an operations guy, Yeah. if I can't change the configuration with said, I'm not putting it on my system. All right, so the comment is, if you can't change the configuration with said, he's not putting it on his system. <laughs> Yeah, I get a lot of pushback server, about that. As, yeah, as, as a, a server. server administrator. As a server administrator. Well, you know, and, and that's what you're used to. You're used to using SED or whatever to change your configuration files. Because I have good tools to, to do that. You've got the tools in place, and that's what you're doing, and you know, I'm not trying to push you to change. But if you had grown up doing that all with SQL commands, well, you would be doing less work today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just saying. Yeah, but then I have to learn a new schema for every application You've got to learn a new schema for every text file that you're editing to. No, they're all pretty much I and I files. So Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Obviously if you're yeah. infrastructure automation, it is code, then if it's I and I files now it's everything that couldn't be. No, you're right. And you're right. First and, and, then. and as long as I have a SQLite binary that I can run to, to make these And there's a there's an SQLite binary that you can run on every machine that you've yeah. got. Okay. Which is, which is <laughs> I'm, all right, see, I, get, I do get a little bit of skepticism from, from the configuration management people who are used to bringing up VI and going to town, and I get that, I really do. So, so there's a level of, all right, so I've, I've built. But have you ed ever manually edited the configuration file for Firefox? Yes. <laughs> okay, you are hardcore. <laughs> Not many people have actually done that. Not all the keys that are available in 
browser? Yes, you, you can actually do things in Firefox by manually editing the configuration file yes. that you cannot do from the graphical exactly. interface. Yeah. I don't even know where that file is on my computer, okay? <laughs> All right, so, so I will say this. Having developed, I've been a yes. developer for 15 years. Having developed that way, there's application level configuration and there is user level configuration and then there is user data. For application level configuration, I would argue still you use flat text files. User level configuration, stuff them in SQLite. Yeah, this is the problem. That I was <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do I communicate to my developers? This is what you should do with SQLite, and this is what I think you should do in your application with SQLite. Here's how yeah. you draw that line. That's it's, it's a hard line to draw. Bottom line, I don't have, a, I don't have an easy it's, answer for that. It's, a, it's an actor problem. If it's, yeah. if it's a user, stuff it in SQLite. If it's a, an administrator, it okay. needs to go. Yeah. Now, of course, I'm biased toward SQLite. I mean, you know, if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So, <laughs> so I tend to put everything in SQLite, but that's just me. All right, uh, the brown, the guy with the brown, t yeah, that, you too, the ones looking around. Yeah, you had your hand up first. Uh, so I'm curious, it seems I'm not it's great. Okay. Oh yeah, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Absolutely. Um, some database engines don't do real well with binary. I, I went to the talk yesterday on uh, it was the for MariaDB, and it's the, the the fast way of getting data in and out, and it's called um, Handler Socket, and it will not do binary data, for example, because apparently, if you're in the MySQL world, you only store numbers and text. I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know why that is. Oh, pardon me? If you store anything bigger, it'll lose it. Oh, but, and the reason that is is because if you store anything bigger than numbers and text, it loses it. Okay, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't have any information on that. But yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's no problem to store n truly massive binaries, blobs in SQLite, and it stores them reliably. Megabytes, tens of megabytes. Uh, performance tends to, to go down off of just, if you store a 10 megabyte blob, I mean, if you're just reading one blob, it's still instantaneous on modern hardware, okay? But it's still slower than if you were to open it and read it directly off the disk. But, you, but at the same time, it, uh, you get transactions, so that if you're, you're writing to, if you're writing that blob back out and you lose power, you've not corrupted it. You've not corrupted the blob. But, but you might lose your blob. Well, if it you either you either have the old version or you have the new version. You don't don't have anything in between. It's an atomic operation, which is depending on what that blob is, could be an important thing. Um, so There's certainly smaller blobs like thumbnails, you know, up to 100k, definitely store them in your database. That's the right thing to do. So I guess my question there was not so much the the access of the individual blob, but how does that have, act, how does that affect the performance of the overall access to the database file. So does writing no, no, blobs no. to the database access? No, the writing blobs to the database file does not slow down access to other fields in the database. Okay. Well, I say that if you've got a blob and other data on the same row in the same table, you want to put the big blob at the end. Otherwise, it has to seek past the blob to get to your other data. So other than that fact, if they're, if they're in different tables or on different rows of the same table, uh, it doesn't affect impact, in, it does not uh, uh, detract from the performance in any way. Okay, question and the light green shirt. Actually, I had a comment more to his question. Okay. Is, is to keep in mind more that more configuration file pushback. Well, no, no, to keep in mind that SQLite is a database, it's a data persistence layer. So, I mean, when you're talking about configuration files in your application code, I mean, that's app, not data persistence. This is, like you were saying, it's a document. Yeah. And so you're storing user document information there, not necessarily application code or things that are core and central to what you would want to version control. So, so the comment is that, that uh, you know, storing configuration files, that's... I mean, it's kind of... Like some, yeah. Some configuration, sure, if it's user options, that's data that's not part of your core code. Yeah, but if, I, if, if, you were going to write a, if you were going to write a website or a desktop application to, say, configure XINETD, wouldn't you rather be able to just 
poke into a database rather than having to read and parse these database files? I mean, the, 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 the text files for X, X on it D, for example? Yeah. Yeah. Scripting even. I mean, yeah. For all kinds of things, but it's for data persistence. It's not the code. It's, 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 there's a difference between data and code. It's okay. Whether it's a centralized SQL relational database model or a SQL data store flow. Yeah. So you're looking at the at, at the the files in Etsy as scripts, yeah. as opposed to code, as opposed to data. Right. They're scripts. Right. I get that. Yeah. They're part of your. Yeah. All right. Yes, so, so the comment was, yeah, if it's changing at runtime, you want a database, and if it's constant, possibly in the read-only layer of your puppy distribution, then leave it as a text file. In the back. Yes, um, question going back to something that you uh, said near the beginning of your presentation. Um, I've used SQLite um, a moderate amount, and I do like it a lot, so thank you. Um, You're welcome. Yes. Does it have like some data encryption facilities built into the storage engine, or is that something more that's being done at the application level? All right, so the question is, can you encrypt an SQLite database? And in fact, you can. Um, and in fact, uh, some of those applications that I showed you up there, in addition to having the public SQLite databases that you can read, use encrypted databases. I won't name particular applications. You can go back and figure it out for yourself which ones encrypt their data. Um, we set, we, the, the encryption part is not public domain. We sell that as an extension. That's one of the, one of the, one of the ways we you know, support the business. Uh, you know, our business there's, uh, I've got three guys working on this, maintaining it for everybody in the world. And we sell you know, paid support. And then we've got these extensions like, like an encryption extension. But even if it's not encrypted, the people who are doing, that are doing forensic analysis, they tend to need a lot of help in figuring out what, what the bits actually mean. Because when they're doing the forensic analysis, they're not getting an intact database. What they've done is they've gone and, and, and imaged a disk and found some sectors in there that have been deleted, but not overwritten. And they're saying, well, this must be part of an SQLite database. And then they're trying to decode what that means. It doesn't have the complete context, so you can't just put it into the browser and or you can't put it into SQLite 3 and, and do queries against it because it's incomplete. I have two minutes left. Yes, sir. So um, when it comes to SQLite, does it support any sort of um, caching? And the, the reason I ask that is when you're, you're going over to like an enterprise database, uh, with the caching, you try to get your queries to come out of cache so that you don't have to go down to the I.O. layer and get a penalty of coming off straight off a disk. So how does the performance work when your, your file is just right there on the desk? And yeah, yeah. Right so the question is, does SQLite support caching so that if you repeat a query, it, it, it remembers the previous query in cache and just returns the, the cached version? Yeah, so you're not hitting I.O. all the time. Yeah, um, you, there are facilities to do that, but the application needs to, to, to get involved a little bit. There are facilities that enable that. And I get a lot of, I've been getting a lot of pressure, I have one minute left, I've been getting a lot of pressure to build that in and make it automatic so that your application doesn't have to worry about it. But yeah, that can be done. And but the, it, because you're not going across a network to a server, it's pretty quick. And also because you've only got a single application working on it, uh, you tend not to get repeated queries because that application already knows the answer. It, it's really handy with a client server where you have multiple clients that are asking the same thing, but here it's just a single client so you don't. Okay, we're probably, I think we're pretty much out of, t out of time, but I'm happy to, I'll be around all day and we can talk later if anybody's interested. Thank you very much for coming and being attentive. Thank you so much.
Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.